Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. We speak with some of the best teachers from Australia and around the world and try to learn what makes them so good at what they do. Today's episode is a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart, and Lorraine Rushton. Lorraine is a yoga teacher and the founder of Zenergy Yoga. She's a leading authority on yoga for children and teens. She's trained over 1,000 people on how to teach yoga to children and teens in a way that is meaningful, impactful, and fun, and is an active advocate of the benefits of yoga for the young. As you'll hear in this episode, Joe and I have both had a little bit of experience in teaching yoga to kids, so it was great to be able to ask Lorraine some questions we'd both been absolutely dying to ask. Lorraine caught up with us while she was in Melbourne to lead a teacher training, and I believe she'll be back in town next February, so we'll let you know when that is happening. Now, before we get on with this episode, I just wanted to let you know about an upcoming event in the Melbourne area. Former guest of the podcast, Cara Leah Grant, is coming over from New Zealand to host a one-day immersion called The Unbound Life. Cara Leah spoke with us way back in episode 17. In that episode, along with a lot of other great stuff, we got to ask her what she does to facilitate a meaningful retreat or immersion experience, so I'm sure this will be an absolutely fantastic event. I will leave a link for that in the show notes. All right, that is more than enough from me. Let's catch up with the rain. Oh, it's so exciting to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me along. I grew up in the north of England in the beautiful um, area in the Yorkshire Dales. So I had the this lovely experience of being in, uh, on one side of me was the Yorkshire Dales and on the other side of me was Leeds, the city. And so I had the best of both worlds. But I always knew that I was never going to stay there. I always knew I was going to go somewhere else and travel. And I didn't know what I was going to do when I was growing up, but I did know that it would be involved in working with either helping people or being a part of a cause or something. I was always very passionate when I was growing up about maybe women's issues. I was, you know, I'd be out on minor strikes, anything political I was into. Uh, I'd go marching on CND demonstrations and I'd be very much a in part of the, the peace movement growing up. But even though it sounds as though I was kind of involved in all these these things and I was had this mission and, and, and was strong, I wasn't. When I was growing up at school, I can remember feeling very isolated. I always felt like I was different from my family. In my family, I was the different one always. I was vegetarian. I chose to be vegetarian from such a, a young... I can't remember. I say the word choose, but I wasn't really a choice. I can remember uh, my mum telling me that I used to have the meal in front of me and I'd push the meat to one side and I'd eat everything else. And it, so it wasn't really a conscious choice. But back to growing up, in, in I never felt part of... that I connected with the group of friends at school, that I, I was in a supportive, loving community or environment. And I, I felt very alone. I felt very isolated. I didn't have a lot of confidence. And... There was one teacher at school, one teacher who saw something in me, saw my potential, believed in me, always had time for me after classes, chatted to me, encouraged me, and somehow got me through my exams into university. I never thought I'd do it. I never thought I would get there, but I did. And once I was in university... I just knew afterwards it was time to leave England and go and do something and travel and be part of something bigger. And I knew the best way to travel was to get paid for it. So it was either be a nurse or teach. So I studied teaching and went off around the world teaching. And I've I've taught in many countries around the world, which has been phenomenal. I've loved it. And then I found myself in Australia and it was home. It was it was home. And so I've been here for well over 20 years now, maybe 25 years. And absolutely, yeah, it just is Manly Beach has been the place that I've called home for, for a long, long time. And so that then when I first arrived, I was teaching. I was teaching English and then I um, became a senior teacher and started to help direct a, a language co- at school. And 
loved it and was very passionate about teaching. But then I found yoga nice. and, and I took over. So how, how did you discover yoga? A colleague at school had been telling me about this phenomenal yoga class. Come and do this yoga class, Ray. You'll love it. And I tried a bit of yoga. And it was different styles of yoga. And I can remember going into this a yoga school. And it all seemed really weird. And they were chanting. And I didn't know what it was about. And I'm from the north of England. <laughs> and I went with a girlfriend. And we were way too immature for it. And we saw ourselves at the back of the class laughing our heads off and I thought we we're going to get kicked out and so we, we left and that was my experience of yoga so when when my colleague said come to yoga you love it and I just I put it off and thought yeah, yeah yeah and then eventually I got sick I had lots of digestive issues I um, had headaches I had really low energy I ended up on this whole year-long path of seeing doctor and specialist and specialist and specialist and ended up in surgery and I came out of it at the end and they, I said, okay, so, right, that's done. So oh, is it all good? Is it all fixed? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. Here, wrote me out a prescription, passed it across the table to me, didn't even look at me. And so I took the prescription and said, okay, and what would you like me to, you know, do I take this one today? Do I? Yeah, every day, however many it was. I uh, said, so how long, how long would you like me to take this one? And she said, well, for the rest of your life. And I just knew that that wasn't right. But I didn't know what was right. And so I thought, I'm gonna go and try that yoga class. And I went into my first yoga class uh, with, with my colleague, and it was a type of meridian-based Japanese yoga therapy. Within a few minutes of doing it, the teacher would say things like, okay, now feel this. This is to lengthen out the spine or maybe you'll feel one side feels longer, one side feels duh, 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 like this. And I thought, yep, I can feel that. I know exactly what I'm doing. I can, so that impacts that. And I was in. And then I saw the head of the school, Andre Gospodacci of Rioho Yoga, and he took one look at me and said, ah, oh, large intestine issues. There's no way. <laughs> How, how on earth, how, you know, how do you know? And so he told me how he could see. He did a diagnosis for my face and my body and how I was standing and what was happening for me. And he knew that one side of my intestine wasn't functioning. I wasn't absorbing and it needed to get fixed up, which was why I was feeling depleted and tired. And I had, it wasn't cleaning out properly. So I was getting headaches and needed to detox. And he gave me, I don't know, three to five exercises to do. He said, Ryan, do these every day for the next three weeks, and then come back and see me, played with my diet, tweaked a few things out of my diet, and within three days, headaches cleared, fogginess went, energy came back, and within three weeks, all my symptoms were completely gone. I've never had an issue since. Wow, that's Ooh. amazing. And that was it. That was it. I was in. I think the funny thing there is that you're actually sort of doing his prescription still. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, it really was. It was from the from the moment that I had my direct experience, I knew that I I wanted to learn more. It was this whole world opened up, this universe that I never even knew existed, that we could heal ourselves, that we can do something to impact our health, that food has has a direct impact on different organs that there are specific exercises for different organs in the body, for the, the spine, that we can heal things, that um, we can empower ourselves, we can look after our health. And that was it. I, I wanted to learn more. So I did my first teacher training course with him. So it's a meridian-based yoga therapy course mm -hmm. um, in Rioho Yoga. And, and I got to work. And I, I still taught a little bit, and I slowly built up my business now this is going back over what, like 22 years ago or longer. And so when I first started, you know, I did what you do. I went into gyms and taught in the yoga studio and got up really early in the morning to do privates uh, at the other side of Sydney, five o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. And what I found happening was the kids would start to join us in the mornings, you know? They'd hear this noise and they'd start to come down in the pajamas and sit on the couch and have a look at us and think, oh, what's going on there? And then eventually people would start to bring their kids into my adults' classes. And 
I loved it. Every time everybody would do a relaxation or lay down in Shavasana for a moment, I'd look straight at the kids and say, right, let's do this. Let's try this. Let's do this one. And then people in my clinic practice started bringing kids into, their kids in to see me for coughs, colds, asthma, all the way through to leukemia, weight issues, back issues. And I didn't get it. I didn't get that I was supposed to do kids yoga because nobody did kids yoga. And the training was adult yoga. It was all adult yoga. So I did adult yoga and I loved teaching the kids English, but I didn't think I could teach them yoga. And so I just did adults for a few years and the kids came to me. And then one holiday, about a couple of years into my yoga business, and by that stage, you know, I was just teaching yoga. I was in Bali and I can remember it distinctly to this day. I was lying in a hammock reading a book called The Prophet's Way and in the, the book it was about um, a guy's journey with finding his spiritual awakening and he met his spiritual teacher and it was a, a German guy in Germany who led a very simple life and it was about his philosophy of looking after creatures and the way he, he talked to people. And uh, so there was one moment in the book. So I was getting around to this book, looking out at the fields in Bali, I mean, a really lovely time. And there was one moment in the book and it was one, maybe even one paragraph, one page. And it was that he, he adopted children and he brought the children into his biological family. And it didn't matter where they'd come from. It didn't matter how many foster families they'd been through. It didn't matter how many schools they'd been kicked out of. It didn't matter what their behavior was like when they first arrived at his house. The moment they crossed the threshold and walked from one side into that house that they'd stepped home and that for the rest of their life, they'd come home, that no matter you know, if they went to college, they came home for holiday time. If they had a partner, they brought their partner home. If they had children in season holiday times, they brought them home. And something in me at that moment, just I just knew without a shadow of doubt that my purpose is to, is to work with kids. This is it. It was, now you'd call it an aha moment. It was my aha moment that I just knew in every single cell of my body that I'm here to work with kids. And I came back into Australia thinking, well, how do you do this? What, what, do you, what do you do? And there was a message on my message bank, my phone bank saying, hi, Lorraine, a colleague of mine, I'm giving up my yoga school, I'm moving to Brisbane, I've given away my classes, but there's one that I thought you might be interested in. And I've started a conversation with the local high school about them bringing yoga in as part of sport. I wondered if you'd be interested. I was like, no way! <laughs> that fast? Wow. Yeah, so that was the start. That was that was the start of it. What do you think it is about teaching kids in particular? Like I know it's kind of resonated you on that deep level, mm. but what is it about kids? That's such a good question. If I think about it, I suppose there's two aspects to it. The first one is that on a personal level, I want every child to have an avenue to have a place where they feel safe, loved, secure, nurtured, a place where they can learn all the tools to feel that they've got all the resources that they need as they go through the challenges in life or at school, feeling bullied, feeling insecure, feeling left out, feeling isolated, stressed and anxious, with mental health challenges, whatever is going on for them and for the whole of the rest of their life. They've, they've got this whole toolkit. I, I feel like it's, you know, when you're a teenager, if, if you now could write your then self that letter to say, here's what you need to know, that I know right now it's feeling as though it's all too much and you don't know and you don't have the answer or you're feeling whatever's going on for you. If you could write yourself the letter from everything that you know now, everything that you've been through, there was one person for every single child that they could walk into that class and that teacher was there to tell them, to give them that wisdom and those words, you know, what a gift. So that's, what, that's on a personal level. On, on the other level, it's over the last 20 years of teaching children's yoga, I've seen the statistics skyrocket. You know, when I first started teaching, I, I saw that it was 
every guy I'd go in and I'd think, oh, okay, let's strengthen up the backs or let's let's do some belly work or let's work on their posture. Now I think every teacher needs to know how to deal with teaching the tools for mental health, for stress and anxiety, for self harming, for the, the kids cutting themselves, for the, the eating disorders. And so much of mental health now we, we're starting to learn starts in teenagers. And so, yeah, it's the, it's, and I feel like if you're a yoga teacher and you've got this, you've got this knowledge. Um, I said this a few years ago at a yoga therapy conference that if you've got this knowledge, then it's your responsibility. You know, it's time to get into action and go out there and, and, and whether you're afraid of going out there and teaching kids or teenagers, it's not about you, it's about them. Go and just go and teach them something. What would you have loved to have been taught? Go and teach them that. And that's it. And if that's your whole thing you teach them, then that's it. I, I hope that answers right. your question. It does, but it also asks me more questions because it's such a tricky area because a lot of this is really beyond the scope of practice of a yoga teacher. And you know that a lot of the kids are struggling with those issues. So how, like when you teach... Is this something you address directly or do you try and more focus on like wholeness or kind of practices that will help most people be able to like kind of settle into a state of calm and ease? It's like a really yes. challenging area. Yes, yes to all of it. Yeah. Um, it depends if you're a teacher going in, well, firstly, it is out of the scope of most normal yoga teacher training courses. So you need, will need extra training. So that will be one side of it. Get trained up, get trained up well, know you're gonna do a really good job and for them and be confident for you. So you go in there and you walk out and you think, I nailed it, God, that was awesome. And you come out, instead of it feeling like, oh my God, that was a nightmare experience, you come out feeling, I really did something there. I feel fulfilled and I feel and your heart feels full. Or you come out of teaching the little ones and you're laughing your head off because somebody said something that was really funny. But they they all by the end of it were relaxed and calm. That would be one side, get trained up and do it, get trained up well. Um, and then the other side will be, well, depends whether you're teaching, are you teaching a general class? Is it you going into a kindy and um, then you're gonna go general. Is it in a primary school or are you going into high school as part of sport? Then teach something general applicable to the sport curriculum. If you're going in as part of the well-being, then educate them about mind and how the mind works and that we have something called thought and that we have the ability to observe thought and, and do something about the thought and that it's not you. You know, give them, give them access into and tools to deal with that or emotional well-being. And the one thing I've really noticed from teaching kids, what you're saying about getting extra training so you feel like you're really equipped. Kids can tell if you're a little bit rattled or if you're not 100% clear <laughs> on what so you're saying. They can so They can like sniff that out from a mile away. Absolutely. Have you, have you, have you ever taught? Have you yeah, taught yeah, 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 yeah. I teach not little kids. I usually teach like year nines and year tens and sometimes going into VCE, they often bring me in for that how to deal with stress, stress week yeah. and I definitely have a few questions for you because I have kids classes that I've taught where it's felt kind of like crowd control yeah. where I'm just like right you know I don't say this out loud but their energy is <laughs> everywhere they're all really crazy some of the it does seem to be the guys they're feeling a little bit awkward so they're expressing that through acting up and so usually my strategy is right let's move let's yep. all get moving let's do some things that everyone can do let's do some fun challenges that we can all laugh at if you know maybe we don't like land that crow pose and then usually by the end of that I do get to a place where everyone is ready for shavasana and I feel like even if the class has been kind of not exactly calm, a lot of action, a lot of loudness, a lot of laughter, they do really kind of get the meditation. So Wonderful. I would like it if it didn't take me 45 minutes to get yeah. to that place where they're ready to like relax and listen without me being on full. I guess like it's a lot of your energy to bring together that group if you know, they're all over the place. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I often laugh, I have to say you have to be, your energy has to be bigger than the entire class put together to start with. But then 
Um, it's learning a few different things. So number one would be knowing what to teach, what to teach the, the specific age group. So what would, what's the age appropriate to teach for the three to fours or the five to eights or those tween age kids or the teens? So the what to teach will be really important. How do you structure the class? And I love that you said you get moving. So absolutely, I think one of the hardest things for the mindfulness movement is that they go straight into what we would classify as towards the, that they're trying to do the end part of the class before they've moved them. So the easiest way into kids' minds, energies, bodies, um, is movement. Get them moving first. So what movement do you do for the different age groups? The second place to learn would be the how. And I say often the how is more important than the what when you're working with kids. So many adult yoga teachers start teaching kids and even teenagers and they go in from their adults classes where everybody's completely quiet and we all manage to hold our thoughts on the inside without it popping out of our mouths. And and so we're able to have this space where you can think about what should I do next, what should I do next, what should I do next. But often the adult yoga teacher voice is the same pace, the same tone, and we love it because for our minds go, yes. <laughs> Whereas for kids, anything that's the same tone, the same pose, very quickly becomes boring. Mm -hmm. And if it's monotonous and boring, they're going to chat, they're going to muck about. So the how is going to be really important. I, do, do, I talk about how in every single one of the training courses that I run, because the how will be whether you have got this, it's this, the classroom, the teaching skills to change your pace, your voice, your tone, your, your um, variety, your pitch, make it unpredictable. And then the third place will be classroom management. Because if we don't have strong classroom management and we don't know how to manage the classes, you're not gonna get to this lovely shavasana, you're not gonna get to this lovely, the place where you want to teach them the tools. Because you're too busy dealing with get out from underneath your mat. <laughs> stop hitting the stop with your mat. Stop be chewing, get you stop chewing the bolster or stop pushing your friend over in tree pose. <laughs> exactly. Um, so classroom management will be a big part. Um, and you know, in my foundation course, we start talking about classroom management. In the advanced course, we spend three to four hours on classroom management because without it, my, I learned my, my big learn was in my first year of teaching. And I got the opportunity to teach an entire high school of teenage girls as part of religion. So instead of going into their religion curriculum, their religion class, the religion teacher brought them down into the chapel and we did a yoga class. And so I was teaching seven classes back to back every day of the week. How was your voice by the end of that? It didn't take me long to realise something needed to change and it wasn't them and it wasn't the class structure, but it was my classroom management. Um, and so now I've just, I just worked out how to get year, even the year nine boys quiet within 10 seconds. And then how do you keep them quiet the whole way through? So it's getting them at the beginning and then what do you do? Because classroom management starts before you even walk in the class or before they walk in the class. In fact, one of the teachers from a high school of boys, where I used to teach them the whole high school sport, and I used to go and teach them yoga as part of sport, one of the teachers came and trained up with me because she wanted to learn how I get them quiet and keep them quiet throughout the whole yoga class. <laughs> Not interested in the yoga, interested in classroom management. So yeah, the three areas, the what you teach, all the different age groups, how you teach them will be important, and classroom management. I mean, you know, the thing about teaching at schools as well, and I know I've had other friends who teach kids who had some challenges with this, you have the teacher there as well. And my approach is I usually just tell the teacher to do the class. And, you know, sometimes the teacher does the class. Sometimes they just sit up the back on their laptop. Yes. But I know other people have had a little bit of friction with the teacher as who is in charge of discipline. Yeah, absolutely. This is a question many graduates will come in and ask me. So maybe they finished the foundation course, they've gone out, they've had a go at teaching. They come back in into the advanced course and say, okay, this situation happened. Something happened with the teacher or what should we do? So for my advice would be for new teachers, if you're not feeling confident and you're walking into a school, there will always be a teacher there because legally there has to be a teacher in the room. And Go, I walk, always walk straight up to the teacher, I introduce myself, and if they know me, if I have the multiple weeks, I'll always check in, say, how's your day been? Have a little chat to them, make sure they're okay, 
and then I'll ask them to help me out with whatever bits I want them to help me out with. So I will have, the way I will control the kids will be, part of it will be with rules, with consequences, and I might say I'll have, I'll do this, these three things, would you mind doing these three things for me, or help me out, or if I need some help, I'll ask you. So I usually go up and then I'll, for new teachers, ask the teacher to give you some help where you'd like them to, and if you're confident to do it on your own, just let them know that you'll look after the class from this point forward. They are welcome to join in and you'd love it if they would, or they can sit and they can do their marking or put the legs up the wall. But if they're doing the marking, please would they just stop marking when it comes to the relaxation? Because they aren't aware, um, they're fully, their minds are right focused into all this work and they're catching up on stuff. They're not aware of this lovely calm energy in the room and everybody can hear them scribbling away or rustling the papers so I just ask them to do that and yeah don't don't feel bad about it you know I always say to my students in the advanced course from the moment you walk in it's your room your class your um, class your class I think a lot of the time the issue comes up because the teacher's probably not clear what you want I think that's when, when people don't know where they stand, yeah. they don't know if they should help, and sometimes them trying to help is actually just throwing off the energy of the group because yeah. it's kind of taking away from you up the front as mm. the person who's guiding that flow of energy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Enroll them in as part of your team and then tell them exactly what you'd like them to or not do and they'll be very happy. Did that help? That was great. Ooh, good. I've got great. another question for you. Yeah. I, Sometimes I do this and sometimes I don't. It actually just depends on how long the class is. Sometimes at the start of the class, I've got everyone to go around and say their name and just, I've said, so what would you like to get out of this practice? And I'll go and give some suggestions like relaxation or strengthening or yeah. you want to learn more about how the mind works. And sometimes that works great and I get some really good answers and I feel like sometimes that's kind of slowly going around the room time means that we start with a bit of scattered energy. Yep. Like it already gives people time to start chatting with their friends. And yep. So do you find out names and find out a bit about no. the kids or you just straight into no, it? No, because you've just handed control to your class. Never hand control to the class at the beginning of the class. You're asking questions from our advanced course. So oh. in the advanced <laughs> course, it's great. But you will because you've been teaching. So you're already out there. You've already got some questions. So yeah, so from the moment that you start there'll be specific things to do so that you have control of the class, that you get their attention, you get their energy, you get them involved in the class without them saying a word and you want to train them in behaviour where they're not going to say a word but they will understand if they want to say something, maybe they put their hand up. Getting information from them is really valuable. A way of doing that at the beginning of class, if you want to, would be get them to write it down and hand it in to you. Yeah. Have it all ready. Have your piece of paper ready. Have them maybe, if you haven't come to the advanced course, you don't know the structure yet for the energy template of classroom management, have them maybe lying down, do a little how do they feel today, walk around, put a piece of paper at the bottom of their, their feet and a pen, ask them to sit up and just write a note for today, how would they, what would they like to feel like at the end of yoga? Or they could think of it in their mind. If you want the direct feedback and you're with them for a term, one of the best things we ever did, but it was at the end of a class, and we had a whole term with a, a group of teenagers, and we did, we just couldn't think of... We'd, been, we'd taught them for one term, we'd done self-esteem. We taught them for a term, we'd educate them about their minds. We'd taught them for a term, we'd done chakras. And we'd had them for numerous terms. We, thought, we just thought, we were out of ideas, and we thought, okay, what should we do this term? And we said, why do we ask them? So we did a general class, and at the end, they came up out of relaxation, they had a piece of paper, a pen, and we just asked them to fill in some, some questions. And the questionnaire was things like, why did you sign up for yoga? What would you like to get at the end of, of this term? If you could change one thing in your life right now, what would it be? And at the end, when we collected them all in, and we read them all through, of course... The one thing that stood out, when we wrote the question, if there was one thing in your life what, what would it be, that you would change, what would it be? Now, we just threw it in. It was our last minute thought. We thought, let's throw that one in. And guess what they all, what do you think they all wanted to change? The Teenage place. girls, exactly. Every single one, something about their body. And as soon as we saw that, we just knew, okay, it's 
body image. Body image, self-esteem, self-confidence, and that's where we went for the whole term. And I feel like that is such a powerful time to intervene in someone's life with someone's view of themselves because, like, teenagers' bodies are changing so much and they're just getting bombarded with so much media. To be able to, like, steer that in a positive direction and give them tools to be at home in their bodies and to cultivate some self-love and some acceptance and some strategies as well to deal with the tough times. It's so powerful. There's, you know, in every teenage class you will have you'll have something like one or two of them who will have been contemplating suicide. You'll have a third of them with mental health issues. You'll have kids in there who are suffering stress and anxiety. You'll have body image issues. You'll have so much stuff going on behind this, behind the, the attitude and the brick wall that, that, is, that is out there. But there's such a lot going on in, underneath. And teenagers, we say, are at this crossroads moment in their lives. They're at this moment where their decisions that they make now, the thoughts that they have about themselves now, are going to impact them for a long time to come. You know, as we know as yoga teachers, your thoughts lead to your feelings, lead to your actions. So if you are thinking to yourself, I hate myself, then what actions are you going to be taking? Well, that's where we see all the... The, the statistics now, the growing statistics on mental health, uh, harming themselves, eating disorders, uh, mental health issues. What actions are they going to take? What relationships are they going to have? What friendships are they going to have? Are they going to bother in school? You know, If we're going in there thinking, let's teach them about green smoothies, who cares about a green smoothie if you hate yourself? So to be able to go in there and absolutely be that person who can help them to be aware of the thought and that we, everybody has these thoughts, they're not alone in this, and how to switch them and how to replace them and the impact that they have on their bodies, their minds, their physical, and the impact it will have for their life. You know, as yoga teachers, we can set such a strong physical foundation for kids from, from, from little, these little things. We can set their foundation physically for life, but once we get into the mind, we can set their mental blueprint, particularly with teenagers, for years to come, That's years this, and years. And it's this real like space where people can enjoy their bodies in a non-competitive environment. Like other than like that's why I love teaching yoga in PE because otherwise PE is all competitive. It's achieving. There's someone who's good at it. There's someone who's bad at it. And even things like dance as well. Yep. You know, there's people who are great dancers. There's people yep. who feel embarrassed when they stand up and dance. And so, but like, there's no failing at yoga. Like this is a practice for everyone. And you, this is a practice that you're doing to feel good mm. and to get to tune into your body and to have tools to calm your mind. And so I feel like it's just such a powerful intervention. It is for everyone. We have graduates now Zenji graduates teaching in early childhood centres, kindies, high schools, before school classes, after school classes, lunchtime classes, vacation care in libraries, community centres, hospitals, detention centres here in Melbourne. A teacher took yoga into the only detention centre for adolescents that's linked to a school and she was in the school teachers who came and trained. And now she is, she's going in there and the boys have got an option of coming in to do yoga in the, the adolescent mental health units now. It's just, it's, it's becoming everywhere and ev they can all do it. And that's it. There's, you don't have to be picked for a team. You don't no. have to be good at it, not good at it. It's great for the elite athletes and it's great for kids with special needs. We teach, I teach in a special needs school up in, in Sydney on the Northern Beaches and you know, or with, for the kids with disabilities, all of them, everyone, everyone can come and do it. And I, I used to teach in a school in Sydney where it was part of sport and they used to send into the class the special needs kids with the a teacher's aid with them. And they also used to send me all the ones that were on detention and they'd send them to me all the ones with behavioural issues because they knew that A, I could control them and B, that it would be valuable for them, they'd get something out of it and they'd, they'd like it and they wouldn't muck about because, because at some moment they will get in. And it, 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 for all of them, the kids who want something physical is there. The kids who want the mental aspect is there. The kids who want to feel emotionally calm and happy, it's there. It's, you know, it encompasses the, the it's so holistic. 
So this is a little bit of a different direction and it was a great question from a friend of mine and it comes from Instagram. I see it too. There's some really little kids who are doing yoga postures with their yoga parents yeah. and sometimes pretty extreme ranges of motion. And I just wanted to ask if there are any health risks or potential consequences in later life when like young bones are still developing kind of do you know, I love that question because we always get the questions about the um, Instagram and and the adults doing the Instagram pictures, you know, in, in bikinis. But we never get asked about this. But now it's true. There are a lot of people using their kids in their Instagram shots. Mm. From a yoga therapy perspective, we would always look at, or when I, when I say that, I'm saying meridian-based yoga therapy, we would always look at you strengthen first and then with, from the strength, then the flexibility comes. So it would depend on, are you just looking at them overstretching, 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 without any balance in there, then it's gonna create problems. Um, you want to make sure that there's always a balance, that if they become too flexible, are they gonna to come too floppy? Is it gonna impact joints? Is it gonna impact spine? So you definitely want some strength in there as well. And is there something specific about developing bones? Yeah, you just you do want to be careful with little growing bodies and little growing bones. However, having said that, so then you'll see you'll have all of the the lists of what not to do, and you'll walk into your class, and there will be Jimmy upside down doing a handstand. There'll be Lucy doing a wheel. There'll be somebody in this pose and that pose, and you'll walk in and think, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you just popped up into that on your own, you're probably fine. You're then. probably okay. You're probably not going to overstrain anything. But probably the bottom line and the code for working with kids is that you don't go in and you don't do adjustments with them. So if mum is squashing them in or stretching them into a pose, then that's not going to be great for their bodies. If they're naturally able to do it, then okay, great. But maybe they're not practicing that one pose for that one insta shot. That where's the balance? There's, there's, God, they've got to be making sure they're balancing it out. And I guess also the balance of like, it's awesome to do fun, cool things with your body, but you're more than what your body can do. Which is the you message know? of yoga. Exactly. Which is why in Zenji Yoga, I train people in a template, a lesson plan template of 10 components. We've got the physical is just one out of 10 components. We also work with the self-esteem, we work with the self-confidence, we work with their minds, we work with the social interaction. There's so much more to it. We teach them about appropriate, um, being able to say yes, being able to so, uh, say no. Oh, that's another There's really powerful lesson. There's so many other aspects. You know, you can be in the, there's an educational component. In fact, one of my, my um, graduates in Singapore just taught her second lesson in a school in Singapore and she uh, sent me a, a message last week and said that, that the teacher who was in there watching her said, I've seen so many kids' classes, but that was phenomenal. I never, even, I never knew you could educate children in a yoga class. But of course we can, you know, you can educate them about their bodies, about nutrition, about the alphabet, about French, friends, well, whatever it is that your, your intention is to teach them. So recently I, I've been teaching a family friendly yoga class. When I was asked about it, it was presented as a gentle yoga class. And then when it became publicized, it was a family friendly yoga class. So I was a bit startled to discover this. <laughs> And this um, is a free class that our council put on. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it's it's got a whole range of people from seniors to, to young mothers and, you know, little toddlers. So I was just wondering if you had any advice um, to help there. <laughs> Go back and ask them to, re, re, to reframe the marketing yeah. <laughs> and start to bracket it off. I love that it's a community class. If it's a community class and it's marketed that it's just a free class for everybody, then everybody was going to arrive and hopefully expect that they won't be quiet in the class and that they'll be fun and they might be running around of kids. And I've seen those those classes and that's great. That's fun too. I can, when I first started teaching and I was teaching adults, what I what ended up happening was family yoga because the kids started to join in or parents started to bring their kids into classes. And so I ended up having this family yoga situation. At that time, 
I pitched it, I did it so that we did it mostly adults yoga and then we'd have moments where, and then the kids would do the bits that they wanted to and not do the bits that they don't want to. When I'm training in the Zenji Kids teacher training courses, then my focus is more on the kids. So for those trainees, I would be saying focus on the kids class and bring the adults in and always have a moment in there if it's if it's parent and child where they can get to do something for each other, not just yoga with each other, mm -hmm. but have a moment where they get to do something with each other for each other. Maybe they just turn to each other or they write down three things about you that I like and then they can gift that at the, to each other or they can say to each other five five things that I, I love about you or three things that I'm grateful for today are so they can start a positive conversation with with parents. That's always something lovely and parents love getting that. And also for the kids, they then get one-on-one -on -one quality time with parent, which is focused so they're not thinking of anything else. The phones are not on. They're not putting on getting dinner ready or packing lunch boxes or doing a million other things that that child gets that unequivalent attention, that 100% that attention, that full presence for a period of time and build that in. And if you can, if there are other people in the class, then have, um, have the parent and the child do that. And it'll be a good chunk. It'll be five to 10 minutes of your class and have the people who are not with their children doing a bit of journaling or something, mm -hmm. colouring in something, mandal. We're okay now, we can do colouring in for adults, it's in, it's cool, <laughs> it's my <laughs> fault. We can have them, have, to, have them doing some colouring in while they're doing, or get them to write a little gratitude letter for somebody who stood out during, for them um, in their network, and then they can go and gift it to them, or not, it's their choice. <laughs> Yeah, otherwise, ask them. I mean, do you like it? Do you like doing the family yoga? I do. It's really challenging and, you know, I have to project the entire time. But it is really rewarding and just so much humorous stuff happens I'm during stuck. the past. You know, like there'll be there'll be mums doing downwards dog with a little kid on top of them and, you know, all sorts of It was a pretty adventures. cute story you told me about the week you did lion's breath. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I did lion's breath. A couple of weeks ago and it turned out there was a little kid who just coincidentally had a lion's tail so <laughs> so that yeah, that worked out pretty well but yeah so it's been a fun you know it's a fun learning experience and I do try to acknowledge the fact that it's going to be loud there's going to be all sorts of distractions and that we we should just sort of try and work within that and you know have a bit of fun and and, oh, I, and I think yeah. everyone's still getting your classes oh, oh. are really busy every week. Yeah, yeah, you know, everyone is getting something out of it, so yeah. Try all different things. Have a moment where you could do um, something like, it's mindfulness, it's kids' mindfulness time. Okay, everybody, take in a hula hoop, put some mandalas around or some yoga poses, mm -hmm. and they get to choose a yoga pose and they can sit and they can colour in for five to ten minutes, 50 minutes, and then you can do some yoga with the adults and then bring them back in. Nice, yep. It's a good idea. Yeah, something <laughs> like that. So at least you can, you're just going to have to have different structure, different segments mm. for your class. Mm. So you could have a partner moment where they yep. do partner work yep. um, and then the kid and child, a kid and, and parent just join up some of the adults together if they're not with their child, mm -hmm. have the children doing something at some stage yep. Yep. and then have... You know, relaxation. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I can really see um, how your background as a teacher has just like brought this real richness to your classes because I've never considered getting people to write anything or colour anything or have person-to-person -person moments and that can absolutely all be like self-reflection and yoga. So it's like a really interesting insight into like, oh, we don't just have to be on a mash, you know, doing poses and doing breathing. Like no. kids yoga can be anything. The endless possibilities. The beautiful thing about kids is they've got no preconceived notion of, oh, I go in and I do this. So whatever you do with them is yoga. So you can do anything. We can do books, stories, games. You can take fun things in. You can take props to use for breathing. For They, can, they love massages. Do massages with them. Once you do massages, they want to start the class, 
do it in the middle and end with the class. So do they massage massages. themselves or do they massage each other? Each other. Yeah, even my special needs kids do massages. When I first did it with them the first time, and I'm saying even, I should qualify that. So when I, I work in um, a school, which is a school for kids who are, have got either some kind of disability or uh, somewhere on the very low end of the spectrum uh, of functioning. So they're very high needs in the school to be able to get into the into the schools. And there's also got to be some kind of intellectual impairment in there as well. So when we work with them, and there's very little language. So when I'm, I'm teaching them, we don't have words. They can't answer what, why, how, who questions. So literally, they just wait, they follow me. I have to be so engaging to keep them with me the whole time. Otherwise, they'll, they go. They go off into their own little world. And the first time I went in to do massaging with them, and I thought, okay, let's do a partner massage. And the teacher just said, oh, this isn't going to work. So I said, oh, let's try. So I said, why not? Let's have it. Let's just give it a go. They loved it. <laughs> they absolutely loved it. So I just curled them up into a little ball, into child's pose. And we do something like the weather, because they all know the weather. And so we just start tapping off with our fingertips. And oh, we like tap little with raindrops. little raindrops. And then in comes the thunder. And then you can chop in their back for lightning. And then you can smooth down the back for a rainbow. So that you can do, you can make things. We'll make pizzas or healthy smoothies. <laughs> you know, you can, so, and they love massaging. Anything like that they'd love. Just not maybe not the teenagers. No, no, that's probably the wrong time to bring that in. <laughs> no partner work there. No, they can stay on the mat. <laughs> Obviously, you would never want to force anyone or push anyone into doing anything they weren't comfortable doing in your class. But do you have some strategies to gently draw in those kids who are just like want to do their own thing off to one side or want to just like talk to their mate and just don't want to get involved? Yeah, well, so that's a question that's... So there's two ways of looking at this. That's a, I always find that one a hard question to answer because it means that you haven't set up the whole context of how this whole class, your class is going to run right from the word go. And if they know you mean business, it's not going to happen. So there's trying to deal with issues that come up during the class, which I just look at is because you didn't set up the whole context of it right from the word go, where they knew this is how it's going to run, this is what's going to happen, there are going to be consequences, and then following through with, with that. So, for example, it might be, one of the rules might be stay on your mat for the little ones because they like to shuffle off their mats and they like to wiggle toward you and they'll all be, they'll all be right, right in front of you. Um, you won't be able to move. Or for teenagers, there's going to be some element of no talking. You know, oh, yeah. One of the rules will definitely be no talking and then and if, have consequences. And if they do, then what, what is it? Is it, or is it a warning? Is it, you know, and, what's, you know, and, so, and so you just have to follow through until they know that you mean it. I must confess, I have sometimes said, so if everyone's nice and calm and quiet, we can start our relaxation now. Yeah. And if I hear any talking or giggling, I'm going to make you do more sun salutes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're about to go into relaxation. and But it, it's also a, it's, it's a practice and it's a discipline and it's a, a discipline of the mind. And we all get into habits, um, chatty habits. And so it's being able to, can you keep that can you stay quiet for this period of time and not continue your habit where you have to have a chat to your friend if you do something new or it seems funny or you think a funny thought? Or or on the other hand, is it a place where you can just now be? Just be. You don't have to make jokes. You don't have to have people like you. You don't have to... There is nothing being asked of you. It's your time. It's your space. And then being respectful of everybody else's. Mm, and the way you put that is really beautiful because I do want to teach them personal autonomy. I don't want to, like, it is about them being in their bodies, but it's also about being respectful and Absolutely. not taking away from anyone else's experience. Mm, yeah. No, I, when I taught the school of the whole of the, the boys, the teenage boys as part of sport, they brought me in there because one of the boys suicided. And so they were looking at other things to do. And they brought me in for the year nines first. So term one, I taught the year nine boys. And I think they thought, if she can handle the year nines, we'll give her the rest. And so in they came. And they're massive. 
And so they came in and I would teach them for two weeks and then they'd rotate, they'd go off and do a different sport and I'd get a different group. Good news was I only ever had to think of two lesson plans. Bad news <laughs> was I always had to, have to start the discipline all over again every two weeks. Within, by the third group in, so by week five, so I had halfway through term, it had rippled through the school that this was awesome. And it very quickly became the best the best sports option of the whole of year nine and then throughout the whole school. And one boy in the end of the year nine wrote on, I asked them all to write me comment forms on how's it, how it'd been, what they'd enjoyed and uh, what their experience was. And one boy, Tom, said, this has been the highlight of my week. Aww. And it's that the strength and the relaxation are both great, but the discipline of the class is what makes it. Wow. And that's it. They love a moment or a teacher that will come in where they feel held, safe, that will, if they say they're going to do something, they do it, um, and where they can get to experience that place inside, maybe for the first time for many of them, without being interrupted by the mate next to them. You know, you really want to lie there. I do this with my partner sometimes. We'll go to yoga and I'll lie there in relaxation. He'll think he's being funny if he if he pokes me <laughs> next to me or I'll just go into relaxation and it'll tickle me oh. and I'll come out there and I'll say hey you know you can muck about during the mo- these moments but when we get into relaxation this is my time, time. <laughs> my time. Yeah. yeah if you could distill all your teachings everything that you bring to your students down to one core essence what do you think that thing would be everything that you ever need is inside Nice. Wow, I don't think we've ever had a guest who's been able to put it in so few <laughs> words and so beautifully succinctly. Yeah, everything that you ever need is within. And that's the job of the yoga teacher, is to lead them. Even sometimes you get one opportunity, you get one class. You can to take them there. Can you do it in one? And you can. Take them inside to that place inside that is always there that they'll have forever. Beautiful. That's lovely. Thank you so much. And thank thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Such a pleasure. Thank you. So, my family-friendly yoga class has finished for now, but I think Lorraine gave some really good tips and advice for teaching yoga to kids and teens, so I'm hopefully a little bit more prepared for next time. Now, I'd really love to hear from you. What experiences have you had teaching yoga to kids? Did you find it challenging? Do you enjoy it? You can reach out to us via the Flow Artist Podcast community on Facebook or reach out via our website, podcast.flowartist.com. Now, our next episode is very special for Joe and myself. It has been a whole year since we started the podcast. And this episode will tell you everything we've learned about podcasting and teaching yoga in the last year and how the podcast has influenced us. We'll also be talking a little bit about our studio, Garden of Yoga, and how the podcast has affected the direction and how we want to take it. There'll be lots of other good stuff there, so definitely look out for that one. That episode will be out in two weeks, but until then, aroha nui, big, big love.